Thank you, Lord, for all of the people gathered here. Thank you, Lord, for all of the people in person and all of the people online. Lord, that we can be gathered in your name, that we can be united by your spirit. Thank you for your word, for the truth that you gave us so that we can walk and we can worship you in, in the spirit and in the truth. And please give us revelation, touch hearts tonight, touch my heart and everybody listening, and uh, that we would receive revelation that this is going to be meaningful time and it's going to be productive and effective. And there is going to be uh, reflections after that, that we are going to reflect upon um, this topic that we are going to touch on today. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Today we are going to talk about the character. Uh, this is uh, the teaching by Torben Sondergaard, and these are, these are my notes from the, from the last Luktensko. Um, I added some verses to the teaching, and so um, we are going to also look at uh, you know, some verses in the Book of Acts, in Psalms, uh, and it will give us a nice, a nice insight into what is this character um, that we want to walk in. The first section is called Introduction, so you can put in the title Introduction. Um, in your notes, right? So if you're taking your notes, uh, put in introduction. The first thing that I want to say about this, the responding to the call of Jesus following God is that a lot of people start good and they end up very bad. So starting well, starting being on fire, being zealous for the Lord, starting with your heart being transformed and being excited is not the difficult part. The difficult part is finishing the race. The difficult part is continuing in faith and not getting distracted, not, that, not getting um, discouraged and not letting any bitterness come in. These are the things that we are going to address today. Um, these people who, um, who start very well and we see them how, how they are strong in faith, we totally do not expect them to fall away. We, we think like, well, this person is the last person to, you know, to end up bad. And what ends up happening is that they do end up bad. Um, we can look at some examples for, um, you know, of people in big churches or people with big ministries where there is miracles following and signs and wonders. And then we realize that there is, there is things happening, there is sin in their life. And suddenly their whole career, they've become an authority in the Christian world. And now it just goes down and, and suddenly even unbelievers are looking at it and they are, you know, they're laughing in some way at the church because they're saying like, oh, okay, this guy who was doing so many miracles, now it turns out that he's in sexual immorality um, or he's doing you know, other things. And uh, we don't have to necessarily name um, those churches uh, because, you know, from time to time there is a big church, big name that comes up and, and people are sad about it because it's, uh, it's sad because so many people are looking up um, to, those, uh, to, those, um, to those people in authority and then um, you know, things happen. So the problem with people who fall away, who end up in sin, who ended up bad, is not that they do not heal the sick. It's not that they don't cast out demons. It's not that they're not gifted enough. It's not that they don't have, let's say, enough anointing. It is their character. The issue is that their character becomes compromised. Their values become compromised and sin comes in and, um, and they end up very bad. Um, so it's never, uh, anointing or gifting is never the problem. It's, also, it's always the problem, uh, this lack of character and the lack of the fear of the Lord. Um, we can take you out on the streets and teach you how to heal the sick, how to cast out demons, how to share the gospel. We can find, um, you know, the sick person on the streets or at Walmart or in a park and you'll get to pray for them and they'll get healed within one hour. You will get to experience healing the sick. But we are unable to take you and sit you down, you know, next to the table and, tell, and teach you humility and teach you character in one hour. So you can teach somebody to heal the sick in one hour but you won't be able uh, to do the same with truly giving them humility and, and teaching them character. It takes lifetime. Um, so that's the difficulty and that's also the beauty of it, that the, your life is uh, the Bible school. The things that you're going to go through, um, this is how you will learn humility. This is how you will learn character. Um, and we should be thankful to the Lord that he wants us to teach us. Um, he wants us to teach, um, to teach us this character as we go through life. Let's look at a, at a character in the Bible um, that really became an example of, of learning character, of, uh, of presenting 
an excellent attitude, an excellent perspective on, of, on life, and um, the, the name of this character is Joseph. So now you can write down, uh, in the name of this section, you can write down the story of Joseph. So we are going to look at the story of Joseph. You probably know um, more or less you know, how Joseph's story goes. So he was born at the time he was the youngest of his brothers. Um, his uh, father, Jacob, favored uh, Rachel, one of his wives. He really loved her. And whenever Joseph was born, um, Jacob was already uh, a little bit older. And so he really loved Joseph because, uh, because he loved Rachel, Joseph's mother. Um, he favored him. He gave him this, um, this coat of many colors. And his brothers you know, didn't exactly like it because uh, they were jealous. And there, there's obviously a lot of things happening in, this, um, in the dynamic of that family uh, because, you had, because uh, Jacob had 12 sons and he had four wives. So you can imagine that there was strife present, there was competition, jealousy present. Um, but let's read about uh, Joseph and what happened to him. We are going to read um, about it in Acts 7. So let's, let's open Acts chapter 7. Uh, verses 9 through 16. Acts 7, 9 through 16. You can read the whole uh, story of Joseph in Genesis 37, um, and it goes from this chapter 37 until the end of the book of Genesis. Um, but now let's look at his story in the book of Acts. So Acts 7, verses 9 through 16. Now the Petrarchs grew jealous of Joseph and sold him into slavery in Egypt. But Adonai was with him. He rescued him from all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who appointed him chief administrator over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine that caused much suffering throughout Egypt and Canaan. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. The second time, Joseph revealed his identity to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Joseph then sent for his father, Jacob, and all his relatives, 75 people, and Jacob went down to Egypt. There he died, as did our other ancestors. Their bodies were removed to Shechem and buried in the tomb of Abraham. Um, had, Abraham had bought from the family of Hamor in Shechem for a certain sum of money. So over here we read, um, you know, what happened to Joseph. Um, what happened before or while they were jealous with him was also that Joseph had two dreams. And in those two dreams, um, it was clear that the message of the dreams was that Joseph is going to be lifted up, that um, his brothers are going to worship him, that even his mother and father are going to, um, to worship him. Uh, and so they were jealous. They couldn't handle it. And they, they, um, they threw him into the pit. Um, the main point is that as he received those dreams, as he received this call from God on his life, it did not happen the next day. He didn't wake up the next day and suddenly, uh, suddenly he, is, um, you know, he fulfilled his call and now his, um, his uh, brothers are worshiping him. You know, it didn't happen like this. He had dreams, he shared those dreams, they grew jealous, they were upset with him. Uh, even his, his dad was you know, upset because he was saying, you know, what are you saying? Do you mean that me and your wife, uh, me and your mother, are going to um, going to worship you? You know, going to bow down to you? Um, so it didn't happen the next day. His brothers were jealous. They threw him in in the pit, and the pit P I T stands for preacher in training or prophet in training. Um, that's um, that's let's say this metaphorical. Well, that's the acronym first of all, but second, uh, that's the metaphor of it as well. Um, then Joseph is sold to Egypt, and uh, Potiphar buys him as his slave, and he, there is favor. There is favor for Joseph. Joseph raises in, uh, in authority. He becomes, um, you know, he's ruling over Potiphar's house, and then Potiphar's wife uh, wants to seduce him, wants to sleep with him. So she keeps on doing this day in and day out. And Joseph, in that moment, whenever she caught him by his clothes, he did the only right thing that he could do. He fled. And yet, he was put into the prison. 
um, why is it the only right thing that he did in the you know in this in the face of sexual immorality is because that's what the Bible says. It says to flee sexual immorality, and that's what Joseph did. There is also times whenever Satan is attacking you, and uh, you are to stand <coughs> grounded in your faith. But specifically in this example, <coughs> sexual immorality, you flee. Other things, you you can stand um, you know in faith and resist the devil, and he will free, flee from you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Joseph got thrown into the prison um, because of Potiphar's wife. She lied about him. He ended up in the prison. He lost everything. So you can see how he was favored. He got the call from God. He was favored in his father's house. Then he ended up in the pit because of jealousy, because of all those things, sold as a slave. Then he rose up in Potiphar's house. Now again, he is down uh, in the jail. His life is, um, you know, is at the lowest point. Uh, the jail wasn't nice. It, it was bad conditions. Uh, you had bad conditions there. There was no lawyer. He had no representation to to go to the court and say, "No, Potiphar's wife is lying. I am um, I'm innocent." He didn't have justice. There was no justice for him. The Bible even says that he was chained to a rock. Um, let's read about um, this condition that Joseph was in in Psalm 105. Okay, so let's take a look at. Psalm 105, 16 through 22. 105, 16 through 22. This is what we read in Psalm 105, 16 through 22. He called down famine on the land broke off all their food supply, but sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They, sh they shackled his feet with chains, and they bound him in irons until the time when his word proved true. God's utterance kept testing him. The king sent and had him released. The ruler of people set him free. He made him lord of his household, in charge of all he owned, correcting his officers, as he saw fit, and teaching his counselors wisdom. So this is what we see here: is that um, that as as he was uh, he was in that prison, he was shackled. In verse eighteen, we read that he was shackled; his feet were shackled with chains, and they bound him um, in irons. He was. This is the conditions that he was in um, in the prison, and we are continuing to read in verse nineteen until the time when he is which means God's word proved true. So God's word was appointed on Joseph's life. He had those dreams. He had this call from God, but it didn't come, um, come, uh, come, you know, it didn't come to fruition right away. It was that in, in those troubles in prison, it was that word of God um, that was proving in him and was proving him. And God's utterance kept testing him. So what God spoke was testing him. So you can imagine... He was in prison, and he remembers those dreams that he had. And that those dreams were testing him whether he's going to remain faithful. And this is what we see is that he never pointed back at God with complaints and accusations. Mm -hmm. That's how this, this testing was happening, that he sees his life circumstances, uh, injustice, that he is uh, he's in such bad, um, bad um, conditions. And there's absolutely no reason for him to be in those bad conditions. And it was the test. Um, he never pointed out God with, uh, with complaints or accusations. Um, and this is something that is so, so, so important. Um, so I found it, I find this verse in the Psalm 105, uh, verse 18 and 19. I find it's like, it's so amazing. It's such a beautiful insight that this call uh, of God on your life, the words that, he, that God spoke over you, that you remember and you're holding on to it, in those times of testing, um, in those times of trial, these words, according to this verse, they're testing you. Mm. Whether you're going to remain in faith or are you going to turn your back on God and you're going to start to stay, you know, God, why did you put me here? You know, and just grumbling and complaining. Um, and verses 20 through 22 is just beautiful because it says that the king sent and had him released. The ruler of people set him free, meaning that Pharaoh, Pharaoh sent for Joseph. Um, he made him lord of his household in charge of all he owned, correcting his officers as he saw fit, 
and teaching his counselor's wisdom. So this is the position that Joseph eventually was lifted up to, to being ruler over all that Pharaoh had and even correcting officials of Pharaoh and teaching them wisdom. I think it's so, so beautiful. Um, so he didn't complain. That's, that's a very, very uh, important point. Now we, we are going to look at certain people that did complain certain people that whenever the word of God was testing them, um, whenever um, this, uh, this word of God was proving them, um, they did complain. And how did they end up? We are going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And here we read this. Don't you know that in a race, all the runners compete, but only one wins the prize. So then run to win. Now every athlete in training submits himself to strict discipline. And he does it just to win a laurel wreath that will soon wither away. But we do it to win a crown that will last forever. Accordingly, I don't run aimlessly, but straight for the finish line. I don't shadow box, but try to make every punch count. I treat my body hard and make it my slave so that after proclaiming the good news to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And we are going to continue reading uh, until chapter 10, verse 13. For brothers, I don't want you to miss the significance of what happened to our fathers. All of them were guided by the pillar of cloud, and they all passed through the sea. And in connection with the cloud and with the sea, they all immersed themselves in Moses. Also, they all ate the same food from the Spirit, and they all drank the same drink from the Spirit. For they drank from a Spirit-sent rock which followed them, and that rock was the Messiah, the Christ. Yet, with the majority of them, God was not pleased. So their bodies were strewn across the desert. Now these things took place as a prefigurative historical event, warning us not to set our hearts on evil things as they did. Don't be idolaters as some of them were. As the Tanakh, the Old Testament puts it, the people sat down to eat and drink, then got up to indulge in revelry. And let us not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, with the consequence that 23,000 died in a single day. And let us not put the Messiah to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by snakes. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroying angel. In order for us to not be disqualified, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, it says, I myself will not be disqualified. So I treat my body hard and make it my slave so that I myself will not be disqualified. So apparently there are certain rules that you have to follow God by, right? There's certain rules. And if you break those rules, you will be disqualified. This is what the end of chapter nine tells us. And chapter 10 tells us what are these rules that Hebrews in the desert broke and all of them died except for two, except for Caleb and Joshua. What are these things? Verse seven, idolaters. Verse eight, sexual immorality. Verse nine, testing the Messiah. And verse 10, grumbling. The first three, or the first, the first two, the first three are pretty obvious. It's something that, okay, that's obvious. You know, um, being an idolater, um, sexual immorality, that's, that's quite obvious. And maybe even testing, testing God, testing the Messiah. But the last, the last one is grumbling. That because they were grumbling, they were destroyed by the destroying angel. So we have to understand the seriousness of, um, you know, of this call that God has for us. And we have to understand that in those times of testing, we are to respond like Joseph uh, with no grumbling, no complaining, because that grumbling, that complaining uh, resulted in the entire uh, generation of Hebrews that came out of, um, came out of uh, Egypt in dying in the wilderness. They all died in the desert because of their complaining. 
Well, Joseph, he kept serving God. He did not say, look what God, God, what you gave me. But instead, he remained humble. And then whenever there was an opportunity to help others, he was in prison, right? And there were two uh, servants of Pharaoh that were thrown into the prison. And both of them had dreams the same night. Um, we know that one of them was the baker and the other one was the, uh, the cup bearer. Um, and both of them were troubled by those dreams. They wanted to know the interpretation. Joseph could have easily said, oh, too bad, find somebody else to give you the interpretation. But no, instead, he responded to them being troubled by it. He responded with compassion. He responded with, uh, with willingness to help. He wanted to serve them. Even though, though all of those years in prison, he was done, um, you know, he was in injustice. Um, so he gave the interpretation to both of the, uh, both of the servants of Pharaoh, and he told the cupbearer to not forget about him. He told him, please don't forget about me whenever you stand in front of Pharaoh. Tell Pharaoh about me. And many years go on, and Joseph doesn't hear from the cupbearer. The cupbearer forgot about him. He didn't remember Joseph. We know as the story ends, as we already read in Act 7 and in Psalm 105, we know that the story ends with Pharaoh, um, Pharaoh reaching out to Joseph, Pharaoh um, taking Joseph out of the prison because Joseph uh, gives the interpretation um, to, uh, of the dreams that, um, that Pharaoh had and the whole land is rescued and Egypt is being able to be established as, um, as a powerful kingdom thanks to, those, thanks to that dream and thanks to the fact that Joseph chose to serve and chose to, uh, chose to um, obey God throughout all of those things that in none of those points he got better to say, oh, I don't want to give the interpretation of the dream because you know, God treated me this way and this way, so I'm not interested anymore um, to, to help others. Um, so this is uh, what we see. We see this example of Joseph. It's such a beautiful example where he went through being favored in his father's house to being in the pit, to being sold as a slave, to being second in the house of Potiphar, to being unjustly and falsely accused, ending up in prison, and then being lifted up, being forgotten by the cupbearer, and then being lifted up, uh, and his call was fulfilled. His brothers came, and those two dreams that God gave Joseph whenever he was a teenager, they came true. His call um, from God became fulfilled after many years later, um, God accomplished through him uh, what needed to be accomplished. And whenever the brothers came to him, um, he didn't respond with, haha, I told you, you know, who is right, who is wrong. Uh, he didn't say any, any of those things. Um, he instead, in that critical moment, whenever Judah is ready to give his life for Benjamin, and Judah says, do not, you know, do not keep Benjamin as a slave, take me. You know, he gave his life for Benjamin. In that moment, it, it really, it really touched Joseph and Joseph uh, started to cry and revealed himself to his brothers. Um, and he told them something very, very important. He told them, it wasn't you who sent me to Egypt. It was the Lord who sent me so that many people can be saved from the famine. Um, I think this is so, so, so beautiful. Um, so as we look at the story of Joseph, we have to remember that it's exactly the same way with us. The call that God has for your life doesn't happen overnight. It is, the, it is life. And as we look at the diagram of the heart, there is ups and downs. And this is how uh, it looks like, is that as you go through those difficulties, as you go through those troubles, your character is being refined. And the, the word of God is testing you, um, as it says in Psalm 105. If we do not, if we do not grow in character, we will not fulfill the call. So it is necessary. It is necessary for our, um, for us to live, for us to uh, keep going on, is to to grow, is to um, to to grow in our character. Um, perhaps whenever Joseph was a teenager and he received this call from God, perhaps there, you know, there might have been a reason why Joseph's brothers were jealous. Maybe, as you can imagine, as a teenager, maybe Joseph was, um, you know, maybe he was carrying the coat of many colors and saying like, hey, now I've got a new coat. Uh, maybe something like this was happening. You know, as you, you can think, you know, a teenager being favored by his dad. Maybe that was a lack of character. 
Um, but we see that after all of those trials, after all of the struggles that he went through, um, he was ready to fulfill uh, the call with the, you know, with this right character. He was ready to be appointed second in the whole land of Egypt. He was ready to build big, uh, big, you know, containers with grain, and and then be responsible um, to distribute this grain to all of the people in Egypt and all of the people that came from Canaan and from other countries to um, to receive food to buy food from from Pharaoh. People that cause trials in our life are the key people in the development of our character. If it wasn't for Joseph's brothers, he would never end up in pit. He would never end up being sold to Egypt. He would never end up in Potiphar's house. He would never end up in prison. He would never end up uh, giving the interpretation of, jo of Pharaoh's dreams. So those people in your life that are causing those troubles, that are causing those trials, they are the key people in the development of our character and in the fulfillment of the call on our life. Jesus, let's look at the example of Jesus. Jesus could not accomplish his mission without Judas. This was one disciple, this is one apostle out of the 12 uh, that was essential, that was crucial for Jesus to end up on the cross. Um, he was the only one. Uh, we all need a Judas in our life, uh, speaking metaphorically, that somebody um, you know, somebody who will, um, who will cause those trials, somebody who, will, uh, who God will use for, our, for the building of our character, that our character would be built. Uh, sometimes we may have more than one Judas. Um, but overall, as we go through trials and difficulties in life, we are to not let the bitterness come in and, and, you know, and for us to start to blame God. This is, this is the one thing that will, um, obviously, you know, there's other things. As mentioned in First Corinthians chapter ten, there is sexual immorality, there is being idolater, testing Christ. But that one thing is is this bitterness, this grumbling, this complaining um, that will, that is seemingly um, not an obvious sin, but this is something that will prevent you from the fulfilling the call of um, God that He has on your life. The bitterness, the bitterness, the bitterness will poison, and it will kill your life and your family life. Um, so we have to make sure that we keep our heart pure. We, we stay away from grumbling. We stay away from complaining. We stay away from any kind of bitterness. So those people, uh, finishing up this section, those Judases, they are necessary for us to die so that, so that Christ can live through us, so that our, our uh, self dies and now we... Um, we live out what Christ want, wants us to, um, to live out. And that's the end of this uh, second section called the story of Joseph. And now we'll take a break. Um, let's take, let me check the time. Okay, so let's take 10 minute break and uh, let's think about it. Uh, I would encourage everybody to maybe take a moment and think about your life, think about the difficulties in your life that perhaps you already went through. And um, by looking at these two examples, looking at the example of Joseph and looking at the example of the congregation of Hebrews in the desert, um, where am I at? Am I harboring any unforgiveness? Am I ha harboring any bitterness, any complaining, any grumbling? Um, and you can just yeah just take a moment uh, during this break to um, yeah to just examine your life, examine your heart, and um, and make a resolution in your heart that I want to be like Joseph. I want to be like Jesus. I want to um, be treated unjustly, and while I'm treated unjustly, I respond with humility. I respond with character. The last lesson of today's, um, today's teaching is called Seasons. Uh, we are going to look um, at a few more aspects um, that connect uh, to what we've discussed in the previous two sections about Joseph and about, um, about continuing <coughs> to follow the Lord no matter what. For a tree to bear more fruit, it needs deeper roots. Um, so whenever we look at a tree, 
uh, we what we see we see the trunk that comes out of the ground and we see the beautiful branches and if it's a tree that you know an apple tree or a tree that produces fruit we'll see beautiful fruit um, but that's not the complete picture there is there are those roots that are underground uh, we have to discern and we have to understand when we are going through this root slash character season so there is a time to grow those roots and this work underground is happening. This work that is not visible, this work that perhaps is not exciting is happening. And then there is times, there is seasons when um, something that is evident is happening. The fruit is growing, the branches um, are nice and beautiful. Uh, we want to bear fruit, um, but you know, it's also about roots, about bearing, about growing that root, those roots. So in the root season, we walk with God, we talk with him, and we are to be faithful. It's time to build our character, um, but we are not to look at other people and other people that are bearing fruit and say like, wow, those people are so active in faith. They're bearing so much fruit. They're making disciples and just being condemned by it. No, in the root season, that's not what we want to do. We want to walk with God, talk with him and be faithful and listen to him. In the fruit season, we don't want to look at people down. We don't want to look at other people and say like, oh, why are we not making disciples? Why you are not, um, not being fruitful? Because perhaps they're in a different season. They are in the season, season of roots. So since life is up, upside down, or upside down, is up and down, <laughs> and sometimes upside down, um, since life is in, in such a way, um, we sometimes relate to God's love in this way, but that's not true. God's love is the same. It doesn't matter whether we are, you know, whether we are up or down, um, God loves remains the same. Um, so we are to walk by faith, not by feelings, not by emotions, but what we currently feel. Because if Joseph, for example, uh, was walking by emotions, by how he was feeling, he could have given up so many times during his story. Uh, he could have given up and just stopped serving and, and just said, okay, forget, forget all of you, I'm miserable uh, and I just want to die. But he didn't do that. Uh, we are to walk by faith, we are to keep our heart pure, and we are to forgive. Nobody and nothing from outside can steal the call that God has given to you. Uh, the same way as nobody and nothing from outside can separate you from the love of God, exactly the same way, Nobody and nothing from outside can steal the call that God has for you. We have to understand that. Um, and the only way for us to be separated from the love of God is through us dwelling on the past, through us uh, feeling unworthy, through us believing a lie. And the same way with the call of, uh, call of God uh, for our life, this is the only way for us to be separated from that call of, um, call of God is that we would, um, we would feel unworthy, we would dwell in the past, we would um, let in you know, the bitterness and those things uh, come in. Um, when it comes to the love of God, um, I would encourage to, uh, for you to read Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, we see how there's this huge list of all of the things that, um, that are unable to separate us from the love of God. And actually, I'm going to read it right now. That's Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 37 through 39. Here we read, No, in all these things we are super conquerors through the one who has loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels, nor other heavenly rulers, neither what exists, nor what is coming, neither powers above, nor powers below, nor any other created thing will be able to separ separate us from the love of God, which comes to us through the Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. So this list is, is big. There's like so many things in there, and none of those things can separate us from the love of God. One thing that is not listed in this list is uh, the past. That is the only thing that is not in there. And the reason why is because the past can separate you from the love of God. This feeling of, of unworthiness, regret, shame, condemnation, these lies of the enemy uh, about, about your past 
uh, can definitely do that. But this is your choice to believe those things. It is your choice to dwell in the past. So we don't want to do that. Okay. That's Romans 8, what? Romans 8. That was Romans 8, verses 37 through 39. Actually, you know what? Even, even earlier, uh, put in 8, 35. 35 through 39. That's even better. Yeah, that's good. Continuing on, there are things that we can only learn by doing it ourselves. That's why Jesus said that it's better for us that he goes, because otherwise he would not be able to send the Holy Spirit. Um, that's why as we go through difficulties, these are the things that we go, um, you know, in person. It is us going through these things, obviously with the Lord. And as we go through these things, we learn. And there is no other way to learn than, than that in those situations. <clears throat> there are different seasons for spiritual maturity growth. So we discussed the root season and we discussed the fruit season. Um, and then there is also uh, three, um, I would say three different seasons for uh, your uh, spiritual growth. There is the first one when we get born again. And so what do we do in that season when we get born again? Well, we need parents. We need people around us uh, to support us, to take care of us, you know, in, in a sense. We need milk and we need uh, that foundation. We need to be grounded in Christ. We, we need to be rooted, right? As, as we're talking about root season, fruit season, right? We need to be rooted in Christ, um, as the New Testament says. Then the second season of this um, spiritual maturity growth would be um, the season of growing up. In the season of growing up, we are becoming dependent on God. We are no longer dependent on people, uh, but we go to God. We, we ask God questions. We listen to his voice um, and we are becoming more and more dependent on him. Eventually, we want to leave home. We want to leave, uh, you know, let's say our spiritual home. We want to um, actually, um, you know, live out this life where, where we take on responsibility. Um, we won't experience the life until we, we live, but we don't want to uh, leave too early or too late. We don't want to do uh, either ones, either one of, uh, of these. And we see the examples, we see examples of some movements, so some, some movements that would send out people to go and evangelize and become missionary very early on. And then because they're not spiritually mature, um, they would get hurt, they would, things would happen to them. But then on the other hand, you have, you have uh, some churches uh, that would keep people um, in the church forever and they would never actually get to you know leave they, they would keep them on milk they would tell them you need uh you know you need to stay here so neither one of these is good we want to leave at the right time uh, not too early and not uh, too late every season is a preparation for the next season that brings more difficulty bigger things more fruit and more trials more hardships more tribulations okay so i'll say it one more time Every season is a preparation for the next season that brings more difficulty and bigger things. Okay, so there will be more difficult things happening, but at the same time, you will see more things, more good things happen. Mm -hmm. You will see much more fruit, mm -hmm. and you will also see more trials. You will see more hardships and more tribulations. And why? Because you can handle it. Uh, as it mm -hmm. says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, is that, um, the Lord is not going to allow you to be tempted above what you can go through. And with that temptation, he will make a way out. Um, you can think about um, this, this like natural birth. Uh, for example, you're born as a, you know, as a baby and um, there is no expectation for you. There is no responsibilities for you. You're to eat, sleep and poop and that's it. And you're good. But then as you grow, um, there's more responsibility. There is more... Uh, expectation you know there's more expectation as a um, as a toddler your ex there, there is certain expectations as a toddler that there wouldn't they wouldn't be there uh, as a newborn and then as you continue growing um, mm -hmm. as a you know seven eight nine year old and a teenager uh, things change uh, and you can relate in the exact same way to the spiritual uh, growth um, so the things that you're doing now let's say as a young adult 
or or as a, as a parent, um, you would have no idea how to do this to do these things when you are in elementary school. You would be like, okay, you would not even know how to approach it. But because you're growing, because in life it's normal to grow, yeah. and you're expected to grow, because of that, now you can uh, you can approach different challenges. Uh, and I'll just share really quick. As a teenager, uh, I would have a lot of free time. Back then, I didn't realize that I, I had a lot of free time. Right now, I realize <laughs> that I had a lot of free time. And as a teenager, I would waste my time playing video games, and 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 that's it. And then once I went to college, I appreciated the amount of time that I had as a teenager. Uh, and I was able to go through college, it was difficult. Um, and I had much less time, then I started to work. And when I started to work, I, I, I started to think about those times as a teenager, or even when I just started college, that, that I was thinking like, wow, I was thinking that life is difficult you know, back then, but now it's more difficult. Now I have even less time. And then uh, you, know, you can just follow, follow the pattern. When you get married, you realize Wow, life as a single, actually. Actually, I had more time. Actually, I had more freedom. And then whenever you have the first child, uh, you know, it continues. Uh, you are progressing and you're realizing like, wow, before I had this baby, I had more time. And I had, uh, you know, and those things that I thought that they're difficult, they weren't yeah. difficult. I don't know if I want to get married. <laughs> well, there's a benefit to all of this, the same way as going through all of those hardships. Yeah. The hardships, um, they are difficult in the moment. It's more difficult than what, what you experienced before. Uh, but thanks to that, uh, you, can, you can progress, you can mature. Um, <clears throat> so it's good, because once you go through more difficult things, you see more fruit. Um, it is in the desert that we learn to hear God's voice. So it's in the desert when there is um, no way for survival other than dependence on God. That's when you learn to hear God's voice because you have to press in because you cannot compromise you cannot go to any other source but to God uh, in those times you learn the voice of God so it's good God will not let you go through hardships that he will not make a way out of and this is what we already um, I think we already read about it I think or maybe we didn't get to that verse in first Corinthians chapter 10 that's where it says that he will make out of it he will make a way out of uh, out of any trial he won't allow uh, you to go through something that you are unable to handle. The trials and tribulations you experience will get harder as you continue the walk, and God has a way out of everything, uh, everything that we experience. He is faithful. And um, as we go through these things, again, there is no place for any bitterness because God is using all of it for his purpose. Something super, super important. Uh, in this life with God, do not hold anything back. Just be, you know, be ready to give everything to God, give everything away. As we see with, um, with the call of Jesus, how he called his disciples, uh, for example, in Mark 10, uh, it's, uh, the call is, leave everything for, for my name. Are you ready to leave everything? Are, are you ready to surrender everything? Um, if you are not, uh, and you are still responding to the call of Jesus, uh, it will be challenging, it will be difficult. Uh, you will suffer, you, it, will be, it will feel like you're dying because that's exactly what's happening, you're dying. Yeah. And so it's easier to, uh, before you respond to the call of Jesus to make that resolution. But if, you're, if, if you've already responded to the call, then now is the, the great time to, uh, to do, you know, stop holding anything back, just, just, um, just be open. Go through this journey, surrender to the Lord and see that He is faithful. And lastly, life is hard, but God is faithful. 